Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on smartphone metadata in action, where we will explore how businesses like yourself can take intelligent decisions in the post-COVID-19 era. I'm Azmin Ansar, Marketing Manager at Credolab, and will be your host for this session. Before we get started, I'd like to state a few house rules to maintain the decorum and smooth continuity of this webinar. Please ensure you're on mute at all times. You may send in your questions over to us over chat at any time during the presentation, and we will address them at the end. Now, let's proceed with the webinar. Let's begin with a quick introduction of our speakers. Our first speaker for today is Jared McElhaney. Jared is the Client Solutions Manager at Adapt Decisions, leading the delivery of world-class configured credit decisioning software and working with clients to unlock the value of automated strategies across the customer lifecycle. Jared has worked with blue chip clients across the EMEA region for over 20 years, developing cradle to grave credit strategies across a full range of secured and unsecured consumer credit products. Welcome, Jared. Thank you, Esme. Our good to be here. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, I just say it's good to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Good to have you. All right, then. Our second speaker for today is Michele Tucci, Chief Product Officer at Credolab. Michele has worked on inter international consulting assignments, product management, and business development roles with the likes of Capital One, MasterCard, Intesa San Paolo Bank, and Telecom Italia Mobile. He has conducted businesses in over 47 countries and has in-depth knowledge derived from nearly 20 years in cards, payments, wallets, consumer lending, fintech, and digital products. Currently, he leads Credolab's product team to develop and deliver unique digital risk management solutions. Welcome aboard, Michele. Thank you, Asmin. Good to be here. Great. All right, then. Without further ado, I hand over the virtual floor to Jared to kick us off. Jared, over to you. Thank you, Asmin, uh, and good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it, it's good to be here. Um, so I'm just going to position uh, the flow of this this webinar quickly, just to explain how, what we're going to go through. Um, so the first the first thing that I'm going to I'm going to just take us through a little session where we're going to discuss the impacts of COVID nineteen and what. Um, it, what impact it may have had on the traditional credit risk assessment data that we we relied on over the years in order to make our, our, our credit decisions. Um, and then we're going to talk about the need to potentially bring non-traditional uh, scoring techniques and modeling techniques into our credit decisioning processes, and also to be able to reevaluate and change and adapt as the, uh, the time during and post the COVID crisis um, and how the world is going to move and our need to be agile and to adapt to that. Um, so once once I've gone through that sort of brief positioning piece, um, I will hand over to Michaela who will talk a little more on the on the um, credit lab scores and, and how they're derived and how they can be used. Um, and thereafter, I will just take us through a little demo of um, a credit decision engine, but really focusing from the requirements of what a credit risk manager needs in his toolkit, in his arsenal, in order to keep abreast and keep ahead of the crisis over time. Okay, so let's start really just looking at, at the high level impacts of COVID and what it's done to the world as a whole. So we can see on this slide here, and these are just indicative graph lines, but some very high level things that have changed. Um, salaries. I'm sure that there are many people on this call that have had their salaries impacted, or at least know people that have had salaries impacted by the COVID crisis. Organizations that have been unable to trade, having needed to, to cut either temporarily or permanently, individual salaries. Some, unfortunately, where, where uh, individuals have been unemployed or companies have ceased to be able to trade and have, have, um, have caused spikes in unemployment, which makes, um, makes for a very unstable environment. And finally, the impact on the economy, where um, 
with businesses unable to trade, businesses unable to conduct, and with uh, customers being in lockdowns throughout around the world, not being able to engage in business, and economies globally are suffering, and we're, we're, we're likely to see recessions um, all over the globe over, over the coming time. Now, what does this mean from a risk assessment standpoint? The challenge that we face is that traditional credit risk assessment and the development of scoring models, whether they be built, built by the credit bureau or built in-house in, um, in application scorecards, rely on the principle that the performance of segments of the population will be the same for those demographics over time. So let's take for an example, if I look at data from a year ago from my portfolio, I might see that um, individuals that are younger are more likely to miss payments than people that are older, right? And this is a, this is a trend that we see globally. And this is probably a trend actually that wouldn't change in the current, in the current environment, but it's an important indicator. I am reliant on the fact that that pattern will hold true in the future when I build my scoring models. And when we see impacts on the global environment of a scale like the COVID crisis, that calls into question a lot of those characteristics. And a lot of that data is not as predictive as it used to be. It doesn't mean that it's not predictive and it doesn't mean that we need to throw away those scores and models that we're using, but it does mean that we need to find ways to augment that and add additional decisioning variables that, have, that, that maybe use different sources of data to try and bolster the, uh, the risk prediction capabilities um, that we had. So let's just take a little look at the, a little more in detail in terms of how some of that data patterns would have shifted. Can I get the next slide, please, Esme? Okay, so typically in, in, in the traditional risk assessment world, we use two main sources of data. Um, the first of those would be the credit bureau. The credit bureau, as we all know, holds the information on consumers um, across all their credit products, all their applications for credit, all their performance on credit, their usage of credit, etc., is held at the credit bureau, and the credit bureau then uses that data to build scoring models and uh, and other types of predictive tools, which are then used by us credit granters in order to um, to, to assess our applications. The other source of information is application data, and this would be the data that we gather directly from the applicants, whether it be salary information and pay slips, or general demographic information, their age, their marital status, gender, um, number of dependents, those sorts of things, that piece, those pieces of information. So I'm just gonna drill into those two areas a little bit, and let's just talk firstly how credit bureau data may have been affected um, across uh, across through the course of this crisis and will continue to be affected. So firstly, one thing that we do know is that credit bureau scores are typically built to be stable, right? They, they need to be predictive, obviously, so they need to, be, uh, to, to rank order and predict risk, but they need to be built in a way that are stable, so they're not over-reactionary to changes. And the way that they do this is they use long... Um, long time periods in some of those characteristics in order to track delinquency on products over 24 months, 36 months, in order to keep that stability in the model and make sure that the, the, uh, an individual scores aren't bouncing up and down every single month. Now, this is, this is good from in a, in a traditional world where things are fairly stable, but we're in a world like we're facing at the moment post-COVID, those models may not react quickly enough. And although the scores would start dipping, they wouldn't necessarily reflect a true position in the short term. So that's, that's one piece. Secondly, in the, in the even shorter term, subscribers um, to the credit bureau to provide their data, their payment data, on a monthly basis. Um, so in that interim time, in the weeks between, a lot of things can happen. I mean, if we think of the world over the last few months, how much things shifted from one month to the next. It's quite incredible how much can change. Um, so that's, that's from the time lag standpoint. Then if we look at also from the data integrity and the data content itself, um, there are certain things that are, that are changing within the data. 
And a lot of organizations, a lot of banks at this point in time are offering things like um, debt rescheduling or payment holidays to their customers because they're aware that uh, this is a, a tough time financially, salaries are under stress, and rather than pushing customers into, a, um, into an NPL performance uh, standpoint and, and writing off the debt or getting it into, into, into serious late stage collections and repossessions, they're allowing customers to take holiday payment holidays for over a two, three, four months, um, or they're restructuring uh, delinquencies back to current. Now, th this is great for consumers and it's necessary to keep the business flowing, but it does have a significant impact on the strength of the bureau data that we're looking at. Because if customers are, are given payment holidays, we're not seeing repayment performance, which means we don't know whether that customer would have paid or not. It, it impacts on the scores. Debt restructuring takes it even further and takes delinquent customers and potentially makes them up to date, make them appear up to date, so they look better than they actually are and it would inflate the scores. So the scores start moving around a little bit. And then finally, on, on this, one of the ways that we control exposure on, particularly on revolving credit card products, is we'll start lowering the limits on customers to ensure that they don't hit us for a huge amount of exposure um, in a time of stress. And by doing that, we're effectively artificially increasing their utilization of the credit products and it makes those individuals appear more risky. So we can see there's a number of interactions in the data here that are changing the way that, uh, that these scores that are calculated on this data may come out and they may move around a little bit. On the application side, there we tend to have, you know, that, that data is a lot more immediate because we're getting it from customers right now. But we also need to be aware that customers that are under stress may, for example, on this, if they've received salary cuts, may be providing false or out-of-date information when they apply for credit products. So we need to be aware of those. Non-salary income sources could be affected. So if, if they own properties that they're renting out, are they still receiving that rental income? We just don't know about that, okay? And finally, the population shifts in terms of products that are being applied for is, is going to change quite dramatically, uh, potentially as customers get into financial stress, they need to tide themselves over for the next few months um, through the crisis and they may start applying for short-term loans where they haven't traditionally applied for those in the past, which means we're now assessing applicants that aren't the typical demographic that will be applying for those products. Okay, so we've had a look at that, at that in detail. Um, Asmin, the next slide, please. Um, so what I want to look talk about here is, let's be clear, I'm not saying that we should be throwing away our application and our bureau scorecards by, by, by no means. That, that, that information is still valuable. And in fact, Credit bureau scores should still rank order. Application scores should still rank order. In other words, lower scoring applicants will be higher risk than, uh, than higher scoring applicants. However, we just need to be aware that some of the data within there is shifted and they may not be as strong as they were. And this highlights that need to bring in other sources of data or models built on other sources of data that can augment those strategies. So on this slide here, we can see, you know, some of those data characteristics that we're using in risk assessment won't have changed or probably won't have changed. Things like applicant age. We still expect that older people will be a better risk than younger people. We expect um, in the, from a marital status standpoint that people who are married are typically a better risk than people who are single. People who have children are generally more stable and therefore a better risk than people that don't. Yeah, and from a credit bureau standpoint, the, the data that says how much credit people are applying for would still be a very strong predictive characteristic. Obviously, in tough times, people more people applying for more credit, and that would indicate a, a potential increase in the risk. Some of the data, though, is going to be a lot less reliable, and I've spoken about these uh, in the, in the, on the previous slide, things like utilization of existing credit products, delinquency, um, those metrics might be a little less reliable because of payment holidays and debt restructuring, et cetera. Residential status, if someone loses their, uh, loses their, uh, their, their home because of uh, unable to pay rent, et cetera, those things can shift very dramatically. And income, uh, as we've mentioned. 
Um, and then there's other information that's completely unknown and isn't really picked up by any of these models in terms of loss of employment or temporary or permanent reductions in salary. For business owners, are they still trading? Um, and if they are still trading, are their suppliers still trading? So they may be restricted and they may have an inability to deliver what they used to deliver. Okay, and then changes in income sources. So not only reductions in salary, but external incomes and uh, household incomes. A lot of organizations assess uh, income at a household level. And maybe I've, I've still maintained my job, but my wife might have taken a salary cut or may have lost her job. Okay, uh, next slide. Oops, thank you. Okay, so with all this in mind, all right, what, what does a, a credit risk manager need in order to be able to mitigate and, and thrive through the current crisis? So the first thing that we need is we need additional, and I say, it's, I say new predictive models, they're not replacements, these are additional predictive models that are developed using non-traditional data because the credit bureau data, as we've just noted, and application data can be suspect. So we need something that's going to be somewhat immune or will be informed by the current crisis. Yeah, the, the models that are built should be continually evolving to keep up with the market because the COVID crisis, as we're seeing it, isn't going to go away anytime soon. And what is going to happen is it's going to evolve over time. So we, we may start off now with a real tight crisis point in terms of lost jobs, et cetera, but the knock-on impacts of that over the coming 12, 24 months is still to be seen. And we don't know where we're going to go to and when the crisis is going to end. So we need models that are continually evolving and continually looking at the world as it is at that moment in time and adjusting as a, 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 as a result of that. The, the models need to be market ready. We can't say, okay, let's start developing some models now uh, and that's going to take us six months, by which stage the crisis is, uh, well, not behind us probably, but certainly a much further evolved. So we need a solution that we can implement relatively quickly. Um, the, the models need to be easily consumable. So preferably something that comes in a form of a score that can be added into a strategy um, and, and, and contains a single metric. And very importantly, as I mentioned before, we must be able to augment rather than replace the traditional risk assessment. We're not trying to throw everything out and start again. That inf the, the, the application scorecards, the credit bureau information is still valuable. Okay, but that's only one half of the equation, those new predictive models. The second half of the picture is to bring in an implementation tool that can deploy and control those strategies because as I mentioned, things are rapidly changing. So I need to be able to keep up with that. So our implementation tool must firstly support rapid deployment of new strategies. It needs to support sure, traditional sure. and non-traditional models. Sorry, did someone said something. Um, must be able to bring all that together. Very, very importantly, we need to be able to analyze and simulate the performance of, uh, of the new models in conjunction with our traditional models. And we must be able to support champion and challenger testing and evaluation over time. Critically, being agile right now, being able to change and modify our strategies on a month to month basis is going to be critical. Okay, so that's, that's, that's my introduction. I'm gonna hand over to Michaeli now to talk about the, um, the Credo Lab scores. And then when he's finished, I'll, he'll come back to me and I'll show you how we go about some of the deployments. Kelly, over to you. Thanks a lot, Jared. So uh, we are going to talk now about a new source of data, new source of alternative data uh, that is core to uh, Credo Labs data modeling pipeline and the way we develop uh, risk, uh, digital risk models. Uh, as Jared uh, mentioned, uh, there is the need now to uh, implement tools that are able to at least complement, if not augment, the predictive power of the existing models. And when we talk about alternative data as um, similar to smartphone de device data, uh, then we clearly want to understand how is it going to affect my uh, risk models is it going to really be more predictive? Is it going to assess a different dimension? And, um, uh, and now that 
uh, we have experienced uh, lockdowns, uh, home quarantines, work from home arrangements. How is this going to affect the ability of a digital footprint to still be reliable for uh, risk assessment? So during the first three months of COVID-19 in China, what we have observed is an increase of the daily time spent on mobile of about five hours more per day per user. This is five hours more compared to the entire average of 2019. This means that we have been generating more data points and bigger digital footprints than ever before. So the next logical question is, how is this increased digital footprint um, capturing behaviors that are likely changing? So on the next slide, we'll uh, see how the mobile behaviors have actually changed. And in particular, the type of mobile apps that users have been downloading have changed. There is a steep increase in uh, categories of apps related to business, education, and games. This is not surprising. As we spend more time at home, we need to keep working. We need to, if we're students, we need to keep learning. And uh, when we're bored, we need to entertain ourselves. Um, not surprisingly, uh, the ride-sharing apps have seen the deepest uh, deep and decrease in uh, downloads. But on the flip side, the food delivery apps and uh, grocery delivery apps have uh, increased. Uh, at the time of the report, uh, this increased only by 15%. Today, this is already at 25%. Also, another interesting behavior that we have observed is the increase on the average weekly hours spent in finance apps. So this means that customers have either um, gone into finance apps to check their savings, to check their investments, and to borrow money. Lastly, the category that, that, um, of apps that showed a nice increase in time spent is apps related to health and fitness and also medical category. So we are trying to uh, keep our mind um, not busy, but healthy. We're trying to keep our body also healthy. And uh, in some cases, we are using telemedicine apps. So all in all, uh, we have seen some shifts in uh, behaviors. And so we have asked ourselves, how is this behavioral shift affecting the existing digital scorecards that Credo Lab has in the market? And so on the next slide, we see the analysis that we have done on a client we have in China, where we have observed the population stability index before COVID-19 and then during COVID-19. So the, uh, the result of the analysis is that there was a slight decrease in the population stability index, uh, but it wasn't affected tremendously. So if you see the distribution on a uh, weekly basis, uh, the highest uh, impact was on the last week of January, where the PSI changed to 0 0.017, uh, which from a, an index standpoint, it means that it wasn't a significant change that didn't need to be investigated. Uh, the flip side of this is also the Gini coefficient. And um, what we observed was that the predictive power of those models, also on a weekly basis, didn't deteriorate much. The conclusion is that the uh, scorecards that we have built on this particular client, for this particular client in China, were uh, predictive enough even uh, before COVID-19 and even during COVID-19, which means that we were able to isolate the micro-behavioral patterns 
that were truly predictive for risk and that did not change because of behavioral changes. If we go on to the next slide, the idea so of uh, this type of, of analysis is that uh, it shows you how the um, a combined model of application based on application form data plus credit bureau data plus Credolab score, Credolab data, it, it uh, ends up giving you a stronger uh, predictiveness, higher predict predictiveness. And uh, this is due to the intrinsic value of uh, different data points that have low correlation with each other, but also due to the fact that um, the Credolab score has usually higher hit rate, higher penetration rate than credit bureau data. So when you combine this uh, low correlation of three different sets of data plus uh, higher hit rate of one of them, then you end up having models that are generally more predictive than those based on application data or only credit bureau data. So now we're gonna go into the action uh, and see how the uh, smartphone meta metadata uh, actually works in a real life demo. Uh, this is an example of uh, how a customer journey would look like. So imagine that we have two customers, uh, one is Mary, one is John, and uh, they apply for a loan. Mary, for instance, applies for a loan through a mobile channel, and uh, uh, she has uh, bureau data. Um, John, on the flip side, also applies through a mobile, a mobile internet, but has no credit bureau data available. So if we go through the, the user journey, the end assessment is that because you have credit bureau data, uh, then you may consider this customer as a thick file and uh, you would accept it. On the flip side, if you have a uh, so-called thin file, could be a millennial, could be a, a new to credit customer, could be a, a small business owner with in unstable income. Uh, you, if you don't have uh, alternative sources of data, you may end up uh, rejecting the customer. So I'm gonna share my mobile screen now to show you how the an actual um, application process may work. Uh, in, um, at Credolab, we have developed uh, a solution called uh, CredoApply. Uh, this is a white label mobile app that can be uh, customized to any bank color look and feel. And uh, it acts as a digital onboarding app. So the customer logs in, uh, can select the loan amount and the duration, the purpose for uh, requesting the loan, let's say for uh, education, and then fills in the details, date of birth, all social demographic information, plus has the ability to uh, add the proof of income, proof of address, uh, proof of ID. So these are all fields that can be customized and even a signature. Then it goes on to the type of employment and um, uh, years in current employment. These are all fields that can be customized to the application form uh, details. And, and then it goes into collecting the mobile device data. So we express, we transparently uh, explain uh, why permissions are needed to extract the access metadata from the digital footprint and what permissions are needed. So we, we say that uh, um, the permissions for, uh, to access SMS, for instance, or uh, media, or contacts, or calendar, or Gmail statistics, uh, these are needed. The reason why a user may give us access to this data is for a credit risk assessment uh, we access only uh, metadata. 
we don't access PII to, to assess the credit worthiness. And so we offer at the end the clear view of which permissions have been granted. If I want to grant an additional permission, I also can do so, or I can still deny it. Uh, the information of a, uh, a permission being uh, granted or denied is also useful from a credit risk assessment. Uh, it can be taken into account for uh, the final decision. And then I submit application. And of course, being a real life demo is not working. Okay, I'm sorry about it. Um, at this point, what in reality should happen is that the app access data and in real time sends a score into the decision engine. And so now Jarod will walk us through what happens when the score is received into the decision engine and how the different strategies can be configured. Thanks, Michele. I'm just going to share my screen here. Okie dokie. Is that visible? Sorry, if someone can just give me an indication. Not yet. Not yet. OK, now it's um, uh, loading. OK, fantastic. Apologies, okay. guys. All right. Um, OK, so what I want to talk to now, right, we have Michaela has just taken us through the um, the Credit Lab score and, and how um, how it works and how well it has been able to perform even through the COVID crisis and, in fact, uh, is adding uh, predictive capabilities. But I'm now sitting on the other side of the fence. As a credit risk manager, what do I need in addition to this Credit Lab score in order to be able to stay on top of my strategies and make sure that I'm taking full advantage of all the data that I have at my, my disposal in order to, um, to do my credit risk assessment. What I'm going to use for this, uh, for this illustration, this is the ADEPT decisions um, decision engine, uh, originations decision engine. Um, this particular webinar is not focused around this decision engine, but it's really to talk around the tools that an, that a, an organization that a credit risk manager would need. And I'm going to just use our, this tool to, to do that illustration. Okay, so to start with, just to give you a little little flavor of how, how the decision engine is going to work, um, well, this is a landing page and it's got some, some, some graphical information on there. This is for a, a, um, a template, a demo client. It's not, it's not real data, but it's, it should provide illustrative information in terms of what we want to show. So just to set ourselves up, I'm focusing purely at this point in time on the credit risk assessment, the risk worthiness of applications. I'm not worried so much around what loan amounts we would be prepared to give or the pricing terms and conditions, although those should be supported by whatever decision engine one, one uses. Um, but if we look at the, at, the, at the principle of what we're applying here, so if I look at this top right graph with the purple bars, this is really a distribution of applications that have flowed through the system. They, um, they're all allocated a risk grade, and we're, we're basically saying that risk grade one would be our highest risk applications, and risk grade seven would be our lowest risk applications, um, and we would decline the risk grade ones and, and, and maybe refer the ones in the middle and accept directly the ones at the top. So this is important for us to understand because when we start trying to adjust our strategies, we probably wanted to, at least as a, as a starting point, look to manage our ac application accept, approve, and decline rates so that we don't rock the boat too much and, um, and overlay our data as we go. Okay, so just to run through the decisioning process to get to the strategy, the first thing that is typically done is we would allocate our applications into specific portfolios. In this instance, we're using short-term loans and long-term loans, um, typically because the criteria and the risk criteria that I'm looking at for someone who's applying for a loan of one to six months might be quite different to what I'm looking for for someone who is a 12, 24, 36-month loan. Um, 
the, the, the requirements, the salary requirements, the risk indicators would be different between those. So being able to separate it into different portfolios means I can monitor and manage each individual portfolio in, portfolio independently and develop strategies around the data and how they correlate and how well they work together within there. Okay, the next important piece that we need to know is that we have the ability to implement our traditional scorecards. So um, what we've got here, I'm just, just to show you as an example, a risk application scorecard. Um, so this would be using the typical demographic information that we use um, in our risk assessment. Um, and we'd be bringing in things like the applicant age, um, the, the number of dependents, their marital status, the residential status, their income, et cetera. And these scorecards, are still very, very important in our risk assessment process. We still want to use these, but what we want to do is augment them with the Credo Lab score. Okay, so what I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move to our strategy component now. And given that we have, a, have limited time, I've just focused on the, the longer term loans strategy. And if we, if we take a look at the strategy components here, what we can see is the first thing that we're doing within the strategies, we'd be allocating a risk grade. So that risk grade is that assessment of risk. And that, that's going to be used throughout the rest of the decisioning process to determine what, what verifications we might need to do setting installment amounts which would drive the loan size and the pricing and the fees, et cetera. All of that, that is, will be actually driven from the risk grade. So the risk grade is really critical um, and that ability to quantify and assess the risk of the individual using the data that we have is really critical to the entire process. So what I've, what I've done here is I've created, as a, an example, a... Um, a very simple risk strategy using one dimension, which is just an application score. In a, in a real world example, we probably have a, a bureau score on top of this as well, but I'm just trying to illustrate exactly how we might bring a credit lab score and overlay it on top. Uh, but you could certainly be using three scores within your segmentation rather than just two. And what we can see currently is the application score is banded from low to high. And as the scores increase, our risk grades will increase. So our worst uh, or lowest scoring individuals get risk grade one, and those would get a D, which means decline. Then our risk grade two, three, and four might be referred, and risk grade five, six, and seven will be accepted. Okay, so it's a fairly simple strategy, but it's, it is representative of what we one might be doing. What we now need to do is bring in that credit lab score and overlay it on top of this. But the challenge that we'd face, at least initially, is we don't know how that credit, credit lab score is going to overlay and perform against our existing application score. So I've defined two different ways of developing a challenger strategy. And bearing in mind that we might, we would probably have multitude of different ways of developing challenges, but these would be our starting points. So. We've, once we first engage um, with Credit Lab and, and, and we start receiving the score, the first thing that we would want to do is just integrate it at a simplified level and see how well it performs across my portfolio. And this strategy is what I'm calling a one-up, one-down strategy. And it's a relatively simple approach. All I'm doing is I took I, I would get a distribution of scores from the Credit Lab team to say, well, what what range of score gives me my bottom 25% of scores, Credit Lab scores, and my top 25% of Credit Lab scores. And I then insert them over in a matrix over my application score bands. So we can see I now, instead of having a single line, a single column, I've now got three columns. The, the column on the left is my low scoring, and my column on my right is my high scoring Credit Lab scores. And the column in the middle is treating them exactly as they were previously, and that's 50% of the population. So the worst 25%, I'm, 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 this is the one up, one down. I'm treating them one stage worse. So the risk grade twos become risk grade ones, and the risk grade threes become risk grade twos on the lower credit lab scores. On the higher credit lab scores, I, I ratchet them up one level. Okay, so it's a very simple, simple strategy that one can put in effect um, fairly quickly. But the first thing that I'm going to want to see is, so what does that actually do? Uh, in terms of my distributions. How is that going to affect my acceptance rates? So this is where it becomes really important for as a credit risk manager to have a tool and some kind of simulation and identify what the impact is going to be. So if I look at the simulation that we have, and 
you'll you'll note uh, this this tool actually stores all of the history of simulations that I've run, and I've obviously worked on this a little bit and made a few changes. But if I open up my simulation report, I've actually have a a report that can do a comparison for me, a difference report, and it will compare the outcome of my new strategy versus, which is my challenger, versus my champion strategy, the, the, the first strategy I showed you. And I can see, running my historic data through there, I can now see that I have an impact on my acceptance, referral, and decline rates. Um, by my decline rate's gone up by 2.7%, and there's been a de decrease in my referral rates and a decrease in my acceptance rate. This, at first glance, looks fairly in line with what I would expect. We're going through a crisis at this point in time, so maybe I'm, I would want my decline rates to go up a little bit more, be a little more conservative with my first strategy. Um, but if, it's, if I'm not happy with that, I can always go back into the strategy, change those score cutoffs on the columns and adjust it so that I end up getting my numbers more in line with what I want. But the beauty of this is that it's dynamic. I can run those simulations over and over again and fine tweak and fine tune the strategy. Okay, so that's 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 our first strategy approach, and that's what we would probably employ for maybe the first month or so um, after bringing in the Credo Lab score. The second type of strategy would just take it a step further, and what we what we can see here. So this is matching accept decline refer rates, um, and in, within this particular strategy, you'll see that I have just expanded the number of columns on the credit app score. So now I would get a full distribution. And over time, as I'm gathering data, I'll start getting proper performance odds within each cell of this matrix. And I can actually set my, my risk grade decisions based on each individual cell of the matrix. And it enables me to fine tune and, and actually really dive deeper into the strategies over time. And remember, as data, as the economy as the world is changing over the coming year, two years um, post COVID, we would need to be monitoring and analyzing these strategies on a weekly, daily, monthly basis. It's not something that, you know, in a, in a traditional world, um, in, my, in my life as a consultant, I would be building a credit limit strategies or application strategies. We'd put them in effect and we'd run them for a year before we'd come back and revisit them and see if how they're working. That just wouldn't fly in the modern world. What we need right now is the ability to analyze, assess, and build new strategies all the time to try and keep up with, um, with the world as it's, as it's dramatically changing. Okay, um, so that the two strategy approaches. The, um, the key to, to all of this is once I've developed a strategy, what I don't want to do is just throw it out there and replace my existing strategy with a new strategy. So this is where champion challenger testing comes in. And this is really, really critical because within these simulations, these simulations are going to show me the impact of the strategies from an outcome standpoint, but they're not going to show me the performance. And for that, what I need to do is run my strategies in parallel and be able to look at the performance impact on those strategies. So if I go back to my portfolios again here, there's what I, what, I, what I absolutely critically need is the ability to deploy more than one strategy on a portfolio at the same time. So in order to do that, what, what my application processing or my decision engine needs to be able to do is allocate random numbers to my applications. Uh, in the case of Adept Decisions, we allocate a number from zero through 99 to every application that comes through the door. That, because of those random numbers being assigned, I can assign strategies to any percentage or portion of my accounts and run them independently but in parallel. So if I look here on my long-term loans, as I've started, you can see that random numbers 20 through 99, so 80% of my population is actually going through my champion strategy, excuse me, and 20% of my applications might be going through my challenger strategy. And I can change those segments. Um, so I could put, if, I've, if I'm really confident in a new strategy, I could run in a higher pop portion of my base to start off with. Or I can start really, really small and test and run from there and then gather some performance information. From a performance standpoint, we, we don't typically want to wait for full bad definitions, you know, two or three cycles delinquent over six to 12 months. But we might be looking at um, 
at first payment defaulters, so look at them over a month period, and then adjust our strategies accordingly and use those early indicators. What is also critical, um, and the last sort of piece that I want to get onto, is the ability within the decision engine to deploy strategies rapidly. So it's one thing to be able to design and, and analyze and, and, and create the strategies really quickly, but if I can't get those deployed into production uh, really, really quickly, then that development time is wasted. And um, a lot of organizations are often um, hamstrung, not hamstrung, but are held up by IT change request processes that might make it take months to actually get a new strategy in place. In place. So a good decision engine that a, any organization would use should allow for your um, risk manager to be able to deploy strategies or at least someone with the, the relevant level of security access to deploy new strategies into the business as and when they've been defined and once they've been signed off and tested. Um, so that's, that's the last critical piece that we need. Bringing it all sort of back together again, once our strategy has been deployed, um, we, can rev we need to be able to view on a day-to-day -day basis through our dashboards the distributions of our risk grades, the distributions of our applications and how they've been um, assessed, what the outcomes are and what the performance is so that I can feed that information back in to my design and re-engage, re, uh, re redevelop, redeploy new strategies over time. Okay, um, that's pretty much all I have to say. We've got about 10 minutes left um, of the slot. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hand back to Asmeen uh, if we have any questions that we want to go through for the last 10 minutes. All right, uh, we already have a question already um, in the line. This one is from Anthony. He says, thank you for sharing, Jared and Michele. Really interesting. Just one question. Are your platforms only used for consumer lending? That is, do you work with SME lending as well? Um, okay, let me talk from, a, uh, from the decision engine standpoint first. And then um, the, the, our, our platform is, is product agnostic. So we, we do have clients that are doing um, SME lending through the platform, although the data is obviously um, quite different in terms of what's used. So we would need to to look at and and uh, and see what what decisioning requirements are. But certainly for smaller SMEs, where a lot of individual uh, in information is used in the decisioning, so sole proprietors that sort of business, then uh, definitely our, our decision engine would uh, would be appropriate to work within that space. Um, I'm not sure on the on the on the credit lab side, Michele. Yeah. Would you have an answer? Yes, from a credit lab point of view, the uh, we assess behaviors of individuals. So the solution works well for retail customers and for small business owners. I would say that uh, above five employees, I think our solution will may not add as much value if the SME that we are trying to assess has more than five employees. Um, our next question is by Raymond. Um, he asks, have you found increased interest in your products during this period? And uh, he also asks whether we will be sharing this link. Um, just for everyone's information, we will be sharing a recording of the presentation and also the presentation deck um, to everyone after the um, session is over. So going back to the question, um, have you found increased interest in your products during this period? Yeah. Uh, Did you so, want to go first? Yes, yes Sorry. thank you. <laughs> so Raymond, thank you for the question. Uh, we have, as a matter of fact, uh, received a lot of interest in, in the last month and a half, where I think uh, risk managers have been looking for alternative ways to uh, make their model stronger. The, uh, there is interest, especially coming from African countries and even more than Asia, actually Latin American countries. Uh, we are seeing a lot of interest coming from Argentina, from Colombia, from Brazil and um, uh, Mexico. Okay. 
Um, from, uh, let me say from, from our side, I would actually like to echo that. Um, I think in the first, uh, the first maybe month uh, as the COVID crisis started settling in, um, it was it was it was difficult to actually speak to anybody, uh, and and there wasn't really interest in anything at that stage because I think uh, organisations were just trying to come to terms with their new reality. What has happened in the, in in the in the last month, however, has been an explosion of interest um, in more uh, dynamic, agile risk assessment tools. So we've been we've been actually extremely busy over the last month responding to. Um, Requests for proposal and demos and um, and uh, uh, requests for information around our products. So absolutely, uh, f uh, things are uh, the space is 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 very very active at the moment. Awesome. Um, the next question we have is from Sanzar. He asks, "Do you plan on extending to Europe and USA, and how?" I'm not sure if this was meant for both. So maybe Jared and Michele, both of you can give um, your share of the answer. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do mine first. Our, our, um, our solution, the Adept Decisions platform, is a software as a service offering um, hosted on, on Amazon Web Services. Cloud, it, it is truly uh, international. It can be used in, in any marketplace. Um, we actually have... Uh, one of our one of our um, senior management members in the team is actually based in California, so uh, we, you know we we're, we're not restricted by borders and we can implement uh, for clients anywhere. Yeah, the same for Credolab. Uh, for we are a SaaS business as well. Uh, we deploy in the cloud and uh, to collect the data, we use our proprietary tools, either a mobile SDK or white label apps or. Uh, JavaScript for online websites. Uh, as of today, we have focused on emerging countries uh, more than developed ones. However, we and we are present in 20 countries uh, that span across uh, Asia, uh, Africa, and uh, Latin America, uh, where we we have seen interest from Europe, uh, from a couple of challenger banks. And although we have not focused our sales efforts into Europe or North America, uh, we know there is demand. If you think about the US alone, there are 35 million people classified as credit invisible. Those are customers, individuals with FICO score below 500. And they, are, uh, they tend to be excluded from mainstream financial services just because of their bad credit bureau score. In uh, Europe, we, uh, we have been cleared by two uh, European banks. Uh, from a GDPR standpoint, we've been uh, cleared as compliant. However, we have not launched with the European subsidiary or the headquarter. We have launched with their subsidiaries outside of Europe, but we still had to comply with the GDPR because of the parent company. Great. Our next question is by Alex. He says, um, sorry, he asks, how did Google Play and App Store react to scraping customer data? Were there any threats of blacklisting the app from their side? Yeah, interesting question, Alex. And uh, um, so there are a couple of components there. One is that we don't scrape data. We access only privacy consented and permissioned data. So from that point of view, the customer knows uh, what data is being accessed, why we access data, and also how we process data. Uh, from a, um, there are a Google back in February, in March 2019, um, they issued a new policy that restricted access to sensitive permissions such as call log and SMS. So call log is still. Uh, a, a closed permission uh, un unless your app requires access to core log uh, for uh, its core functionality to work. Uh, SMS instead, uh, we have as a company, we have 17 apps today in the market where our clients, the financial institutions have chosen to uh, ask for the SMS permission and we have been cleared by Google, we've been given an exception 
to access SMS permission um, on the basis of deriving a credit score for financial inclusion purposes. So we haven't seen much of a threat from that point of view. And as long, my suggestion is as long as you disclose exactly to, the, to your users what you access, what type of data and why, then even your app will be, um, will be given an exception from uh, Google to access even SMS. Okay, our next question is from Lawrence. He asks, what percentage of populations are prepared to share phone metadata? Uh, thank you, Lawrence. The, uh, it varies by, from country to country. Uh, the global average, and it depends also on the type of integration. So as I mentioned earlier, we have an SDK integration for lenders and banks that already have a mobile app. And we have also a white label app. Um, the mobile SDK has a global average now of 98.2%. So of all the SDKs integrated that we have out there, 98.2% of them, they have been granted permissions to access data. Uh, on the white label mobile app, which we call Credo app, or the, the one that I demoed, Credo Apply, the global permission, the global average is 67%, 67. And that means that when the bank is asking for the user to download the app, and the app comes with the brand color and look and feel of the bank, the user has generally low, um, uh, a good perception about it. And also, if the bank uh, promotes the app download in the right way, then uh, in the right way, the best practice we see is that um, it would increase the chances of approval of that particular individual. Then the uh, barrier to downloading the app and granting access to permissions is very, very low. Moving on to our next question. This is from uh, Baron. He asks, do you have any European clients and is your system GDPR compliant? So we do have two European clients. Um, one is a very large consumer finance and the other in Central Europe. And the other one is a, a retail bank or a banking group in uh, France. Uh, we have been cleared by both uh, headquarters, but we have not deployed at the moment within continental Europe. So we are GDPR compliant in the way that we process data, we access data, but we don't have today deployments in Europe. All right. Um, we have another question from Alex. Uh, do you provide the opportunity to integrate some modules as SDK to existing banking apps? Absolutely, yes. Uh, this is the most seamless way to access data. And uh, the SDK, it's important to notice that it is managed by the hosting app. This means that the bank decides when to trigger the SDK, when to trigger the access to data. And the usual point is at submission of loan application. So our SDK doesn't run in the background, does not collect uh, location data, for instance, on a persistent basis. It, it is triggered one time only and um, above, after receiving privacy consent from the user and the operating system's permissions. And then it extracts metadata, not personal data. Well, the next couple of questions are, I think, addressed to both of you. Um, the first one is by Raymond again. He asks, what is a defining factor weakness in credit bureau in the countries or weakness in other data sources? Jarod, would you like to go first? Um, so, sorry, could you repeat the question, as I mean, I didn't quite catch that. Sure. Um, it was, so Raymond has been asked, has, uh, sorry, Raymond has asked whether, what is the, the defining factor from our point of view, weakness in credit I would look. I mean, there's an there's impacts on both. Um, I would say 
Credit Bureau data has been very, very strongly relied upon in most markets nowadays to get that clear picture of, of, um, of a consumer. And uh, it's often weighted more heavily in application decisioning than, than demographic application data. Um, so for that, for that reason, I would say the credit the, 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 the shifts in credit bureau data is probably where more of the impact is going to come from, but it is going to vary very much um, from organisation to organisation, and how strongly you weight on those on those models. Um, application data is often more stable. The, 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 the key impacts that, that we're seeing are more in the in the salary, uh, the income space, and the proof of that income and that and the employment stability. Um, that's where the, the, the where the re really big impact is coming from right now, um, which obviously does impact onto the credit bureau scores as well. Um, but it's only limited within the application data. Yeah, I'd like to add. Uh, I think uh, across most of the emerging markets, the biggest challenge of credit bureaus is their lack of data of the new to credit segment or new to bank segment, and uh, we see. In um, uh, countries like uh, the Philippines or Indonesia, the bureaus have access to about 40% of the population. So you have 60% out, um, out of bureaus, and, uh, the, uh, and that's where alternative data becomes important. Uh, alternative data, there are different sources, uh, different types. You have mobile device data like Credo Labs uh, do, does business, you have telco data, you have utility bill kind of data, you have uh, all the way down to uh, the psychometric assessments and perhaps uh, social media data. Some of these have been proven not to work. Um, there are even university papers that show that uh, social media data may be useful for KYC purposes, but not so much for uh, credit risk assessment. Psychometric data, I think on average you will uh, get quite a high resistance from customers that need to go through a 20, 25 questions uh, to get a, a, a payday loan or a credit card. I think they are more likely to go through a psychometric assessment if they are applying for a car loan or perhaps a mortgage. Uh, telco data is indeed uh, predictive. Uh, we, as Credolab, we put it uh, uh, almost at par with mobile device data. However, they have the... Um, uh, why is it predictive? Because they, they have access to uh, top-up data, uh, so transactional data that gives you the assessment of the customer's ability to repay. And that doesn't have much of a correlation with mobile data. So you could be using both in conjunction, and uh, um, if the unit economics allows for that, then I think our recommendation would be to use both mobile device data as well as uh, telco data. However, the challenge is that uh, you will have access to the data of the customers that are using the telco from which you are buying data. So typically, a, a lender works with one of the telcos. And in a country, you have at best uh, three uh, telcos. So you will get data about, of about 50% of the population. So we go back to the idea that hit rate is important to ensure a consistent source of data and, um, and also to ensure a, a high hit rate to deliver better value. All right. Um, the next one will be a quick one. Uh, it's again address to both of you. Um, Anthony asks, can the interfaces of both platforms be customized in different languages? So for um, uh, Credola, the, if you, uh, the SDK will, uh, um, is language agnostic. So the, um, it will go into the mobile app of the bank and, and so it works in that way. The white label app, today we have it available in uh, nine languages all Southeast Asian languages plus uh, Chinese plus Spanish and, um, and we had Brazilian, uh, Portuguese, Bra Brazilian coming up. Uh, so yes, the, our, uh, our uh, UI can be customized. Um, from the ADP standpoint, yes, we, we are um, 
We receive data, uh, direct info, interfaces through through APIs. They are customizable. Um, most of our clients will typically use a, a, a JSON structure in, in terms of their API to bring the data in. The data is configured at a client on a client by client level as well in terms of what information we bring in to make decisions, um, and then how that gets returned as well. All right, we have next question, um, a pretty long one. Um, it goes, for SME customers, are you already able to assess SMEs supply, supplying to larger multinationals using blockchain to provide further insight in SMEs' credit worthiness for working capital loans in supplying the larger multinationals and also providing insight to large multinational, the complete chain of suppliers? critical to avoid non-supply of certain critical components? Yeah, I think I would like to take the blockchain component out of it. Blockchain in this context is used only to ensure the immutability of the data. And so to ensure that the SMEs participating in this supply chain actually belong to that chain. So having said that, uh, from a, if you're talking about the uh, mom and pop stores that are buying Coca-Cola uh, from a large distributor, uh, then that type of working capital uh, can be uh, assessed also on uh, Credolab's kind of data. Again, I'd like to stress that we do a behavioral assessment of the user, which aims at answering the question, will the customer pay back? So, uh, if you have access to the inventory of that mom and pop store or to cash flow payments, uh, then you can use that to derive, to answer the question, can a customer pay back? So if you combine the two, you have the answer to will the customer pay back and can the customer pay back? What I want to add to that is also that we have a, a feature engine that we can apply to third-party data or banks' own data. So today we have engineered already 1.3 million features on Android devices and 2.5 million features on iOS devices. In one example where we have worked with an e-commerce portal that was looking to extend the working capital solutions to their sellers, we have engineered dedicated features on the e-commerce portal on data. So we looked at not just cash flow, not just rating or rating of the store, quality of the comments. And um, there were um, about 1,000 data points that we used. And we generated 3.2 million features on these data points of, owned by the e-commerce portal. So, uh, the, the way I would look at that is also uh, from a machine learning point of view. So you engineer features, you, uh, you, you work a dedicated data modeling pipeline, and then you identify the features that are most predictive for that particular SME supply chain financing kind of product. All right. Our next question is from Bala Subramaniam. He asks how much of SDK and non-traditional data is still untapped? Um, the, it's a continuous discovery. So if I remember when I joined Credolab, we, had, we were accessing uh, a, a small part of the digital footprint through the SDK. And we, at that point, we had, and that was 2018, we had developed 72,000 features, mostly on SMS data and call log data. Uh, after uh, what I mentioned earlier, after Google restricted access to call log and SMS, uh, we started focusing on truly understanding the digital footprint. So we went from 72,000 features to uh, 1.3 million on Android. And uh, we explored all pockets of data and um, available on the devices. And uh, as a company, we allocate one day per month to the discovery of new, um, new pockets of data within the same digital footprint. So 
uh, I mean, we focus on this and yet we are still learning, we're still finding new uh, pockets of data within the same digital footprint. So it's a work in progress, I would say. Our next question is from Umang Gupta. He asks, how much geography agnostic is the solution? Um, I think we've kind of addressed this, but you can um, take a shot at the question along with his second part, which is, what is the lead time to start this in a new country or a new market? Yeah. Uh, so uh, being a behavioral assessment of users, uh, there are always uh, country specific nuances that we can discover. In, um, however, we've been in business since 2016, and uh, we have now a, quite a good understanding of behavioral patterns that are uh, always somehow predictive. So when, um, when we go into a new country, uh, we have an expert model that we can deploy. Uh, we usually keep it running for a month or two, we analyze the uh, performance of the expert model on uh, the new population and then we calibrate the model. So for us to go live, the mobile SDK can be integrated in a mobile app in as little as uh, two days, including UAT testing. The Credo app, the white label app, can be customized in five days. So you can go to market in five days and the scorecard uh, can be deployed in real time. So um, the expert scorecard. Uh, once we have enough performance data to tailor make the model for a particular country, then it takes us five days to calibrate the model and develop a new one for the new country. Um, yeah, and from a, from a decision engine standpoint, um, as I, as mentioned, we you know we are software as a service, so we are we do reside within the cloud. Um, typically, for a, for a, for a new customer in any region, we're looking at about a month or two to set up. That would be using um, our, our pre-built template. Obviously, the more that one. Uh, diverges from that in terms of particularly the data model um, that may take a little bit longer but uh, uh, would find that the critical path of an implementation for the decision engine it really actually sits with the with the client organization and their testing and their integration is more than the configuration from our side uh, but yeah typically a, a month to two months would would, would be to get uh, an organization up and running all right, quickly moving on to the next question. Uh, this one is for Michele uh, by Oscar. He asked, does Credolab, be, uh, sorry, does Credolab require to register as a credit bureau in the countries in which it operates? So um, is the question, do, if we need to have a credit bureau to operate in a country? Uh, do we need to be registered with a credit, credit bureau? Oh, no, we don't. Uh, we actually we work with bureaus in some countries, not in all countries. And um, uh, we the only country in which we need to be registered as a an alternative credit scoring provider is Indonesia. And we have uh, we are now part of this uh, regulatory sandbox that they launched about a year ago, and we are the only alternative credit scoring provider in Indonesia allowed to use mobile device data for risk assessment. In no other country, it is required. Um, however, in the Philippines, for instance, the banks are required to get approval from the central bank to operate an alternative source of data, to include an alternative source of data into their models. And we've been approved multiple times now in um, in Malaysia, we also were approved by Bank Negara, the central bank there. Uh, but I don't believe there are any other cases in which, uh, perhaps Thailand, yeah, Bank of Thailand required uh, the bank to inform the central bank about Credolab. But as a company, we were not required to be registered or licensed. The next question is from uh, Ganga Lakshmi. She asks, how do you account for specific demographic t tendencies while assessing risk, like socioeconomic uh, background, age, etc.? Okay, as Credolab, we do not 
take any personal information into uh, the model development. We don't. We only use mobile device metadata and we train the algorithms to look for a particular outcome that can be probability defaulting at uh, 30 days past due four months on books, for instance, or a first payment default for credit card. Uh, we use a training set of data, the performance given to us by the bank in an anonymous form. So we don't receive any personal data, we don't receive any gender, income, or uh, ethnic kind of data that might build bias into the model. We don't. We only use mobile metadata. All right. Um, our next question is from Dondi. She asks, um, among thousands of variables, which do you see having more importance that is more predictive uh, power of credit risk? Yeah, so um, uh, this is also correlated to an earlier question where, where the, and now occurred to me uh, to add something. Basically, we, when we analyze 1.3 million features or 2.5 on, on iOS devices, the idea of going so wide is to be able to detect uh, any uh, micro behavioral pattern that can be predictive for risk. So, um, uh, of course, uh, in the modeling, uh, process, then 95% of all these features have zero information value. But it's, in it's important for us not to exclude any of those to make sure that we uh, analyze only the ones that have high information value, low correlation with each other, and also high stability over time. So once we have done this, uh, the categories of uh, data that are predictive on iOS, they tend to be related to uh, images and calendars. On Android, Android tend to be related to app usage and uh, calendars as well. Um, in, at the end of the model, however, you have about 50 features. And so the balance between different permissions then may change between one scorecard and the other. Uh, but yeah, overall, this this would be the most predictive. All right, we have one last question. This is from Raymond again. He asks, if you have the same customer with multiple lenders, is the performance or any other data merged? If not, have you considered it? Uh, it is not merged. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we do not know who is the individual applying for a particular loan. And so we cannot today, even from a technical point of view, we cannot merge data sets. Uh, and uh, as such, we cannot also uh, understand the velocity of a particular device, uh, meaning that we cannot assess whether the same device has been applying for the um, uh, the, um, a loan with a particular lender multiple times or has been applying for multiple loans with lenders that we have all clients of Credolab. Um, the, however, uh, recently we, well back in uh, August actually, we signed up a global reseller agreement with TransUnion and iOvation. So through the iOvation solution we are able to uh, detect device velocity, uh, but uh, we don't do it directly. All right, so that was the last of the questions we received. Um, are there any other questions um, that you'd like to ask? We'll probably give it another 30 seconds. All right, I think that's about it. Thank you so much, Michele and Jared, for the session. And thank you all for taking the time and joining us. Um, Jared, Michele, any last uh, closing words? Um, I would just like to say thanks, everybody, for attending. It was we had a fantastic turnout today and lots of really good questions. So thanks, thanks, everybody, for your time. Yeah, much appreciated. And please, everybody, stay safe. And COVID-19 will finish. <laughs> Yes, it will.
Thank you so much again, everyone. Uh, like I said, we will be sending the recording of the session and the presentation over to you uh, within the next couple of days. Thanks a lot. Have a good rest of the day. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.